Well, good morning. I'm uh, happy to uh, call this uh, hearing to order. Uh, we're here today to revisit opportunities for improving our environment, uh, environmental review and our permitting processes, as you know, in ways that uh, support the deployment of clean energy projects and uh, good paying jobs across uh, our country. We need both. Today is our, our committee's second hearing in uh, less than two months on an effort to chart a path forward on permitting reform legislation and finish the job that uh, we've already begun. What do I mean by finishing uh, the job? Well, I mean build on the work we started last Congress when we passed, thanks to the leadership of our president and members of this committee, literally in this room, and a, a once and a generation investment in our nation's infrastructure and the largest investment ever to address the threat of climate change. In addition to helping uh, us tackle the uh, climate crisis and reduce harmful pollution, these historic investments are already creating uh, literally hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs here at home while helping our nation become even more competitive globally. Still, uh, in order to make these uh, clean energy investments a reality today, we first need to take a serious look at our current permitting processes. During our first permitting hearing uh, just three weeks ago, uh, we learned that our nation currently has two terawatts of clean energy power sitting on the sidelines, waiting to be connected to our electric grid. I want to say that again. Our nation currently has two terawatts of clean energy power literally sitting on the sidelines, waiting to be connected to our electric grid. We also learned at that first hearing that many communities still do not have a seat at the table, and they need to be heard during the permitting process. I believe uh, we can do better, and uh, we must do better. Fortunately, President Biden agrees, and so do many of our colleagues. As I said during uh, that first uh, hearing, I believe that a successful permitting uh, reform proposal must accomplish at least three objectives, three of them. Uh, first, uh, any serious proposal must reduce the greenhouse gas emissions while upholding our nation's bedrock environmental statute. That includes addressing transmission barriers that make it harder for renewables to connect to the grid. Second, that proposal must support early and meaningful community engagement. And third, the legislation must provide businesses with certainty and predictability that they need to make informed long-term decisions. During that hearing, uh, we were fortunate to hear from a diverse panel of stakeholders representing industry on the one hand and environmental groups on the other. And while our witnesses did not see eye to eye on every single thing, all five of them did agree about the importance of engaging with communities early on and protecting our environment as we work to improve permitting efficiency. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe our ranking member also, and many of our colleagues, also embraced uh, this theme after hearing our witnesses' testimony. In fact, uh, most, if not all, of the stakeholders we've met with throughout the past uh, several months have acknowledged that it's not necessary to use a, sl use a sledgehammer to crack a nut. In other words, we can achieve efficiencies without gutting any existing laws, and that's what we need to do. Unfortunately, a number of recent proposals, mostly from our friends over in the House of Representatives, aim to streamline the permitting process using very blunt tools and setting up what I believe is a false choice. If enacted, uh, they may well strip away bedrock environmental protections under laws, such as the environmental, National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. And some of them would curtail or in certain cases outright eliminate the ability to seek judicial review of agency decisions. It is my heartfelt belief that we can provide businesses and communities with greater certainty by using a more targeted approach, and I hope that's exactly what we will do. As Chair Mallory will, will point out in her testimony today, uh, NEPA helps inform roughly 100,000 federal agency decisions uh, and actions each year. Uh, around 200 projects a year require an environmental impact statement, and that's the most comprehensive type of environmental analysis. That said, more than 95% of projects needing approval 
receive that approval under the most expedited form of environmental review. That's known as a categorical exclusion. Say, in everything I do, I know I can do better. I think that's probably true of all of us. And the same is true in this instance. We can improve efficiency, we can improve certainty, and we can improve predictability in the permitting process while also ensuring that communities have an opportunity to make their voices heard. Earlier this month, the Biden administration released new priorities to accelerate federal permitting and improve environmental reviews across a broad range of infrastructure projects. I think there are a number of good ideas from the Biden administration's proposal that could be, maybe should be, part of permitting reform legislation. Among them is expanding the use of programmatic environmental reviews to accelerate permitting within identified regions. Some agencies are already beginning to do this, as you may know. For example, off the coast of New York State, the use of programmatic economic impact statements is helping to create a record of the environmental impacts of offshore wind development. Doing so can result in more timely project level reviews. I also believe that we should expand opportunities for developing clean energy facilities on brownfields, an idea that I believe Senator Capito supports and, uh, and others on our, on our committee. In addition, uh, we should improve the use of digital tools and data sharing between agencies and facilitate greater community engagement. All ideas also supported by the, uh, the Biden administration and by a, a number, maybe most of our colleagues. Still, as uh, we work on this hugely consequential matter, it's important uh, for us to hear from all stakeholders. And that's why I plan to soon release a permitting proposal as, as a discussion draft. That's what we're calling it, a discussion draft. And when uh, I release it, I encourage our colleagues, I welcome our colleagues, along with uh, members of the public, to provide us with substantive uh, feedback. We also have much to learn about these uh, proposals. Uh, we also have much to learn about how these proposals would interface with the work currently being done by the administration to promote timely, effective reviews. And that brings me to uh, why we're holding uh, today's hearing. This is an important hearing. We have a lot of hearings in this room. Um, none of them are unimportant. This, this one's really important. Uh, but uh, we're here to uh, gain the perspectives of, of these witnesses, and we look forward to hearing from each of you, and we thank you for joining us today. And with that, uh, let me turn to our ranking member, Senator Capito, for our opening statement. Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank uh, the three of you for being here today and for what you do every day for this country. Appreciate that. Uh, we're holding this hearing today to discuss a priority for both of us and many of us, modernizing and improving America's permitting process. America's deals are dealing now with rampant inflation, breakdown in supply change, and aging inadequate infrastructure. They're struggling with higher costs and less reliable infrastructure to heat and cool their homes, keep the lights on, get to school, and to work. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was born out of this committee, was designed to address many of these challenges by funding the build out of more road, bridge, drinking water, and wastewater projects, and making the United States less reliant on other countries to meet its basic needs. A year and a half later, <clears throat> we are now seeing that implementation of that legislation, as well as that of the CHIPS legislation, CHIPS and Science Act, and even legislation that I did not support, the Inflation Act, all running into the same challenges that have dogged infrastructure development for years. It comes of no surprise to those of us who've been in and around this space for a while. And that is why I have consistently called for statutory reforms to the federal environment review and permitting processes, including most recently in the Restart Act that I introduced two weeks ago, joined by most of my Republican colleagues on this committee. The processes have become a bureaucratic, confusing maze. Even if a project sponsor successfully makes it through, or even if they make it through three different times under administrations of both parties, as with the Mountain Valley Pipeline in my state, they often hit more roadblocks, litigation. Activists opposed to building any new projects are standing at the ready with a lawsuit to add further delays and costs in the hope of killing a project or inflicting so much pain that a project sponsor will give up, eliminating jobs, tax incentives, tax revenues, and economic resilience in the process. 
As even John Podesta, the president's senior advisor, acknowledged in an event last week, quote, we got so good at stopping projects that we forgot how to build things in America. It's been this way for a while, end quote. The red tape, regulatory hurdles, and endless court battles faced by businesses slow and sometimes altogether stop critical projects. Ultimately, it is the American people who pay. We sometimes hear defenders of the broken system claiming that most projects make it through the environmental review, permitting, and litigation just fine. But that torturing of the data sort of misses the point. The projects that are getting held up the longest, and, and uh, Administrator um, Martha Williams yesterday mentioned this in her, in her testimony, the ones held up longest are those that are the most transformative and provide the most widespread benefits. These are the big ticket projects, the ones that would provide affordable energy to a whole region of the country, create new construction jobs and permanent positions in manufacturing, or connect rural communities with new roads. These aren't exams pulled out of thin air. The Mountain Valley Pipeline, the New Core Steel Mill, and Quarter H are examples of each types of these projects being held up by bureaucracy or litigation, and those are just pulled from my home state. I want to thank all of you again for coming here today. I look forward to hearing for your ideas. However, I'm concerned that your agencies are at best beautifying the existing processes with nice sounding policy pronouncements that really do nothing or are actively making the situation worse with more regulation and delay disguised as guidance to avoid an actual rulemaking process. Despite the rhetoric and vested interest in seeing those investments succeed, I have not seen the administration do anything to actually address the challenges that I have outlined. More than a year ago, your three agencies announced a permitting action plan. It then took your agencies 10 months to release guidance in the form of a 13-page memo to begin to implement that plan. It took 10 months to come up with a plan for the plan. With a, within a month after that memo was released, federal agencies were supposed to provide you with their own action plans to implement that guidance by April the 5th. Ms. Mallory, we talked about this on the phone the other day. I spoke with you about these documents, and you indicated that the administration does not intend to make those plans publicly available. I think it's important for us to hear what agencies have proposed to CEQ, OMB, and FIPC to improve the permitting process as we continue our legislative efforts. We have tried for years in prior infrastructure laws to solve these problems with increased coordination and aspirational timelines, but as we sit here today, the problems persist and these solutions have not worked. That is why we need specific legislation. We cannot waste another year as delays and high inflation reduce the impact of these investments. To truly modernize our environmental review and permitting processes, we must actually amend the underlying statutes like NEPA, the Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act. We need enforceable deadlines on environmental reviews, not goals or soft aspirational schedules that can be changed on a whim by agencies, but we need something that require constant oversight. More importantly, we need to modernize these processes for all types of projects. Pitting renewable projects against fossil, pipelines against transmission, even different transportation projects against each other will not strengthen our economy nor benefit our environment, but only lead to more political bickering in Congress and among industries jockeying to be favored in the process. From onshoring new manufacturing and domestic critical mineral projects to roads, bridges, gas pipelines, transmission lines, our permitting problems affect all sectors of the economy and therefore our international competitiveness and national security. Also, we need judicial reform to end the vicious cycle of projects being held in limbo by activists. We need lasting solutions that won't shift between administrations. And to do that, we must have a transparent committee process, which we have embarked on, and compromise on bipartisan legislation, which we have done in the past and can do in the future. Now, I know that many issues in Congress have become increasingly partisan in recent years, but the need for environmental review and permitting modernization should not be. Both sides are watching their priorities get hung up in the process purgatory. This is an issue that should be approached with common sense and a bipartisan spirit. It's time for us to work together to find common ground and implement meaningful reforms to bring these processes up to date to address those challenges that we face today. By working together, we can find solutions that benefit both our economy and our environment while still ensuring that projects are held to high standards of safety and environmental protection. 
I look forward to hearing from our agency partners and my colleagues today on how we can achieve this together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. My, my uh, Senator Capito and I are both born in West Virginia. I was born in Beckley and uh, still have family there, as she knows. And uh, she's uh, had a, uh, just a remarkable career, and, uh, as has her family, including her dad, including one of her sons, who's uh, running for governor. Um, the, um, one, of the, um, one of the things that we've worked on together in the last couple of years is a bipartisan infrastructure bill, maybe the most transformative infrastructure bill in the history of our country, at least since the, uh, the building of the, uh, the interstate uh, highway. Uh, but uh, coming to agreement on the bipartisan infrastructure bill is not easy. Coming to, to agreement on uh, Water Resources Development Act, uh, not easy. Coming to agreement on uh, transformative uh, recycling uh, legislation, not easy. Uh, but, but we found the middle and uh, found common cause and reported out uh, legislation and we built on that since then. So. Um, my dad uh, used to say uh, to me all kinds of things. Uh, Senator Capito has heard most of them. But um, one of those is the hardest things to do are sometimes the things most worth doing. Uh, this is a hard thing to do. But uh, it's really uh, something that's worth doing. And uh, I'm delighted that uh, three of you are here today to help us uh, find our way so that we can uh, do the work for our country that needs to be done. Now, I, I don't have a... a, a, a detailed uh, in, uh, background to introduce you with. I'm just going to make this very brief and just turn it over to each of, of you. Uh, but um, first, we're going to hear from Brenda Mallory. Um, Ms. Mallory's been here with us uh, before, and uh, she chairs the Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, we're pleased that you're back before us, and thank you for your work and your leadership there. And next, we're going to hear from uh, Jason Miller, who I think changed his schedule. Uh, here in the last week or so in order to be able to join us. Uh, he is the Deputy Director for Management uh, management for the Office of uh, Management and Budget. Uh, Jason, welcome. Glad to, glad to see you here. And uh, last but not least, uh, Christine Rada, uh, Executive Director of the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council. Uh, we'll now uh, begin uh, with uh, listening to our witness testimony. Uh, Chair Mallory, would you just start off and and we'll pass it off to Jason and then to Ms. Rada. Please proceed. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Carper. It's a privilege to be here today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, distinguished members of the committee, it's an honor to be with you today. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the improvements the President and the administration have made to our nation's permitting process. A little over a year ago, I testified before this committee on the Biden-Harris administration's progress to protect and improve the health of the environment in communities across America. We have come a long way in a year, thanks in large part to the historic investments in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act. Your work in moving these laws and helping this administration rebuild American manufacturing, increase American competitive, competitiveness, create millions of long-lasting, good-paying jobs, and tackle huge challenges, including uh, climate change. At CEQ and across the administration, we are laser-focused on delivering the benefits of these laws at the scale and pace needed to combat the climate crisis while securing a clean and safe environment for future generations. Central to that vision is an environmental review process that is working as efficiently as possible. Since its bipartisan passage in 1969, the National Environmental Policy Act has played the crucial role of producing better and more coordinated government decisions that have prevented damaging and costly environmental and economic outcomes. The environmental improvements to the nation's air and water quality and cleanup of contaminated lands have been achieved with the help of the National Environmental Policy Act review process. Yet we know that environmental reviews and permitting processes can take too long. And delays can come at a steep cost to communities, the economy, and the environment. 
With your help, our administration is taking major steps to address the challenge and reform the permitting process to secure faster and better decisions that benefit the American people. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act provide more than a billion dollars to make sure that agencies have the environmental review and permitting experts and tools they need. The administration is also proud to have worked with Congress to successfully reauthorize FAST 41 and the Permitting Improvement Steering Council, which is critically important to improving coordination and accountability for high priority projects. Last year, the President released the Permitting Action Plan, which set forth a strategy for ensuring that federal environmental reviews and permitting processes are effective, efficient, and transparent, guided by the best science to promote positive environmental and community outcomes, and shaped by early and meaningful public engagement without unnecessary delay. And just last week, we announced an ambitious new action to supercharge efforts to build transmission at the scale needed to advance energy security and meet the President's clean energy goals. Due to this administration's progress, we are completing environmental reviews faster than the previous administration did, but there is more progress to be made. CEQ will continue to advance efforts to improve federal agency decision making and the environmental review and permitting process so that we deliver on the National Environmental Policy Act's goal to harmonize economic growth and environmental sustainability. CEQ will also propose a rule that will reform and update the regulations implementing the National Environmental Policy Act to ensure fair and full public involvement and promote better decision making. We are planning a broad public engagement process to ensure that the regulations will achieve better outcomes for our communities and our environment. As we implement these measures, we will continue to evaluate permitting reform proposals to assess their potential to improve the speed and quality of processes for big transformative projects. CEQ is hard at work delivering on the President's commitment to protect our health, our environment, and our communities. The investments that you, Congress, have made will deliver the benefits of a cleaner environment to all Americans for generations to come. We will continue to work with you to strengthen supply chains, lower costs for families, grow our clean energy economy, support good paying jobs, and deliver much needed infrastructure while promoting early and meaningful public engagement and ultimately positive environmental and community outcomes. Uh, I, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Mallory. Good to, good to see you, good to hear from you today. Uh, uh, Mr. Miller, delighted that you could join us. Thanks so much for making the effort. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you on this important topic today, and thank you for your continued bipartisan leadership on improving the federal permitting and environmental review process. Thanks to the passage of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act, the United States is making a once-in-a-generation investment into our infrastructure and competitiveness that will create good-paying jobs, grow our economy, invest in our communities, and combat climate change. But to take full advantage of these historic investments and ensure the timely and sound delivery of truly transformative projects, we need to ensure the federal environmental review and permitting process is effective, efficient, timely, and transparent, guided by the best available science, and shaped by early and meaningful public and community engagement. The President and his administration reject the view that there must be an inherent trade-off between permitting efficiency and timeliness on the one hand and permitting effectiveness and ensuring the best outcomes for the community and the environment on the other. We must and we will do both, resulting in better projects built faster, safer, and cleaner. Make no, make no mistake, the federal review and environmental review and permitting process can and must be further improved. But many common misconceptions about this process persist, including that it is the sole reason for delay. In too many cases, it still is a reason for delay. Uh, 
95% of actions requiring federal review under the National Environmental Policy Act are approved under a categor uh, categorical exclusion, the most expedited form of review. These projects tend to move quickly and expeditiously. One opportunity is to expand the use of categorical, uh, categorical exclusions. Less than 1% of actions require an environmental impact statement, the most extensive type of environmental analysis. Yes, these tend to be the largest, most complex, and most transformative projects. While misconceptions persist, again, make no mistake, the federal permitting and environmental process takes too long and must be improved. The federal government, though, has made real progress in reforming the permitting process through both legislative reforms and administrative actions. The actions of the Biden-Harris administration build on important steps taken under the Obama administration and the Trump administration. In addition, we are leveraging new authorities and historic investments provided by Bill, IRA, and CHIPS to accelerate the permitting and review process. In May 2022, as my colleague noted, we released a permitting action plan to accelerate smart planning, uh, permitting through cross-agency coordination, establish clear timeline goals, track key project information to hold agencies accountable, engage early and meaningfully with states, tribal nations, territories, and local communities, improve agency responsiveness, technical assistance and support, and use agency resources and the environmental reviews to improve impact of those projects. In parallel, the administration is deploying sector-specific teams to facilitate coordination for siting, permitting, supply chain, and related issues ensuring all agencies have information systems, performance measures, and adequate capacity in place to create a more efficient and effective review process, and leveraging the Permitting Council to serve as a federal center for permitting excellence. We have seen the administration's commitment to action translate into real results. Our overall timelines on the most complex proje projects, those within EIS, has continued to improve relative to the prior administration. We have permitted more than 130 wind, solar, and geothermal projects with a combined capacity of 14 gigawatts of power, which has the ability to serve approximately 4.2 million homes with 70 more projects under review. We have approved the nation's first two large offshore wind projects, which are both now under construction and on track to complete reviews of another 15 additional project plans in the next several years. Again, while progress has been made, more needs to be done. The administration fully supports bipartisan efforts to further reform permitting, and last week outlined priorities for inclusion in a bipartisan reform package, including accelerating deployment of critical electric transmission, deploying hydrogen and carbon dioxide infrastructure, improving permitting efficiency and predictability, enhancing data collection needed for effective permitting, and incentivizing state and local permitting reform. We look forward to continuing to work with Congress to implement reforms that maximize timeliness and efficiency, are guided by the best of available science, and shaped by early and meaningful public engagement. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to our continued partnership and welcome any questions you have. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, thanks for that statement. And, uh, and we'll now turn to Ms. Arata, please. Thank you, thanks for joining us. Right. Thank you so much, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito and the distinguished members of this committee for the opportunity to testify today. Um, in particular, I would like to take the opportunity to once again express my gratitude uh, to Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito uh, for, although the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs holds jurisdiction over the Permitting Council, it was your interest, your leadership, and your commitment that enabled the passage of the provisions that ensures this nation will permanently benefit from the accountability, certainty, and transparency that Fast 41 brings to the federal permitting process. With the passage of the Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act, the United States is making generational investments in our infrastructure and competitiveness. And President Biden has been and continues to be very clear on his principles for building our nation's infrastructure and securing America's future. That we must address our climate goals, we must engage communities, and we must provide certainty and predictability for developers. I come to this role with extensive experience in the private sector as an investor, an advisor, a renewable energy developer, and an engineer. And as executive director, my goal is to make the United States the most attractive market for infrastructure investment. This means increased consistency in project delivery, reduced litigation risk, clear regulatory requirements, enhanced predictability, accountability, and certainty in permitting processes. 
And together with the permitting council members, we work to deliver infrastructure projects that are economically and environmentally sustainable and achieve consensus with and benefit the impacted communities and tribal nations. Under President Biden's leadership, the Permitting Council has focused relentlessly on four vectors. To enhance coordination amongst agencies, enhance data sharing both among agencies and also with project developers, to provide more transparency and provide funding to support those efforts. Notably, Fast 41 does not elevate speed over the deliberation that is needed to deliver excellent environmental, economic, and community outcomes. And we have achieved a number of successes with this model. Since our inception, the Permitting Council has successfully permitted 31 projects, reflecting an estimated direct capital investment value of over $160 billion. Our current project portfolio is worth approximately $100 billion and in the past year. We have successfully permitted four major projects worth approximately $40 billion. Uh, they include the 10 West Link transmission line in Arizona, South Fork Wind Project off the coast of New York, the mid Barataria Sediment Diversion Project in Louisiana, and the Alaska LNG Pipeline and Terminal. And since Congress has acted to make the Permitting Council permanent, we've seen renewed and increased interest in Fast 41 project coverage, particularly in the renewable energy, electricity transmission, carbon capture, critical minerals, and broadband sectors. Recently, we've added two tribal broadband projects in New Mexico and Alaska, and a critical minerals project in Arizona. To ensure the timely and sound delivery of much needed upgrades to America's infrastructure, last year, uh, the Biden-Harris administration, as my colleagues noted, published the Permitting Action Plan to strengthen and accelerate federal permitting and environmental reviews. And this plan is being addressed and deployed by an all of government effort at the senior most levels. Cabinet officials are meeting on an almost weekly basis to work through permitting in a very hands-on manner and we at the Permitting Council to provide support to further drive creative solutions and to break down barriers. More than ever, our efforts to provide that predictability and certainty into the federal permitting process is vital, and our work directly impacts the United States' transition to a clean energy economy while providing good-paying domestic jobs and more equitable environmental and social outcomes. President Biden has been very clear on his expectations of us, and with the investments that Congress has appropriated to the Permitting Council, we are able to ensure strong agency coordination and community engagement up front to get those projects permitted, concrete in the ground, steel in the ground, boots in the ground, without compromising on public engagement, analytical rigor, or environmental protections. I very much look forward to continuing to partner with this committee and Congress to pass thoughtful permitting reform, and thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today on this important matter, and I look forward to your questions. Ms. Rod, thank you. Uh, we look forward to your answers to our questions. Thank you for an excellent statement. And for all of you, uh, thank you for excellent statements. Uh, I'm going to uh, kick it off with the question and then turn it over to our uh, ranking member, uh, Senator Capito. Um, the first question would be uh, for uh, Chair uh, Mallory. And uh, would you um, address for us, uh, please, uh, the importance of early engagement, something we heard a lot about at our first hearing, and how legislation could help support early engagement? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Carper, for that question. Um, and, and I think, as you know, uh, the found, one of the foundations of the National Environmental Policy Act is a belief that there is a value to the participatory process and to the ability of um, people to um, be able to speak to their government about the ways in which uh, actions that the government is planning can be improved. And so we have uh, emphasized from the beginning of the NEPA regulatory process the, the need for and the value of early engagement, kind of early and often is uh, a phrase that is, is often said uh, in the federal, um, in, our, in our action plan that we released last year, we placed an emphasis on that um, in uh, actions that uh, um, CEQ has taken independently. We talk about the importance of that. So we, we believe that this is a mechanism for allowing projects not to get so far down a path that there is a, any misunderstanding about what the community believes is important. Um, and so I think that that is an issue that we continue to believe will have some value in um, addressing a longer term uh, issues. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask Ms. Miller to tackle the second uh, question we've got here, and it deals with interagency coordination. Uh, last year, 
The Biden administration released a permitting action plan that's been referred to here uh, today to, uh, to outline the administration's strategies to strengthen and to accelerate environmental review and uh, permitting as well. Uh, one element of that permitting action plan is to promote early cross-agency coordination. And my question is this, how does agency coordination facilitate or impede timely environmental reviews and what administrative and legislative changes can help uh, further improve that coordination, particularly in the context of clean energy projects? Chairman Carper, thank you for the question. And this has been a key uh, reform that has been made both administratively and legislatively in terms of we have large complex projects that have multiple agencies with different permits. We've set up a process and we're trying to reinforce that process and expand it across more projects where you have a single lead agency defining a clear timeline on the front end, bringing together all of the relevant agencies to establish a clear schedule associated with it, the analysis that needs to be done to drive forward on an overall project, make that timeline and project plan publicly available so that we're tracking it, monitor performance throughout by agency with the lead agency driving that charge. That's at the heart of the Fast 41 process for those projects. And we've been, through our permitting action plan, expanding the set of projects that are leveraging that approach. All right, thank you. Uh, just as a follow-up, how important is it for the federal government to also coordinate uh, with states uh, as well as with, um, I guess, with tribal uh, governments, with local governments, um, and uh, just uh, in, in order to facilitate the permitting process? Uh, Senator, thank you. Yes, in incredibly important to coordinate with states, communities, both through the community engagement proce uh, process to identify issues early, but also through the ongoing permitting process. There are efforts underway in Georgia, in New York, of state coordination between the federal government and the states, bringing all of the relevant entities together, sometimes in one room, to make sure that there's enhanced communication, that there's no uh, balls dropped around what data and analysis is, be for, uh, is being performed by whom and by when. That kind of simple set of steps is actually critical when you have multiple parties and multiple entities targeting a complex project, making sure who knows, everyone knows who has the ball so that we can move it forward efficiently. Good, thanks. And a, question, a quick question for uh, Ms. Harada. Uh, as Executive Director of the Federal Permitting uh, Improvement Steering Council, you play an important role in ensuring that major projects move forward in a timely fashion and also that they meet our national goals and priorities. My question is, what is the most important thing, the most important thing, that the Permitting Council could do to improve federal environmental reviews in order to improve certainty while uh, also improving environmental outcomes? Thank you so much for the question, Senator. In our view, we have a, a fairly unique perspective given the role that we play in terms of ensuring that agencies are indeed coordinating with one another for uh, the various projects specifically, especially those that are in our portfolio. Uh, we are able to also observe trends um, across the various agencies, notably around um, two broad buckets, I would say. The first is around what are the policy issues or the policy questions um, that different agencies may have different perspectives on in helping with escalating those or calling the question. The second area is around identifying where there may be um, resource allocation issues with respect to ensuring that the, the work gets done um, on time, on budget, and that we're working hard to ensure that you've got the right brains on the ground looking at the problem at the right time. All right, thanks, uh, thanks so much. We may have time for a second round, and I hope to come back and be able, able to ask you a few more. Senator Capito. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Mallory, yeah, I wanted to ask you a question. In January, CEQ uh, issued interim guidance for agencies to use in evaluating greenhouse gas emissions during their NEPA reviews. I would like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record opposition to the guidance from the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, as well as the American Petroleum Institute, which details how its use will delay realization of many of the investments in the IIJA. So this CEQ guidance, I don't hear objection, so I'm gonna enter it in there. No, um, no objection. Thank you, thank you guys, thank you guys. Um, I'm right here. The CEQ, 
<clears throat> guidance follows a, a trend of federal agencies using guidance documents to try to force policy or regulatory changes outside the rulemaking process and without congressional authorities. One recent example was the Federal Highway Administration policy memo that was in, issued in 2021, which the agency rescinded this year amidst op opposition, including from myself. So, Ms. Mallory, is, is this merely guidance? Uh, do you feel it is not binding on federal agencies? Uh, thank you, Senator, for uh -huh. that question. And yes, uh, the, the guidance um, that we issued is guidance. Um, it is uh, a framework that we um, felt necessary, given that uh, there has been such a tremendous amount of uh, litigation in which um, uh, parties have been told, and the federal government in particular has been told, that an inadequate uh, analysis was done on climate change impacts. And so the guidance was essentially to help and ensure that we have greater um, you know, clarity and consistency across the government in how the analysis is approached and that we are, that agencies are walking through and thinking through the um, issues that need to be addressed in a greenhouse gas guidance in order to meet the, the concerns that have been raised by courses. So it's, it, you know, agencies can use different tools and approaches and they have, um, they have used that as a framework that they can, um, can move forward on. Did you have public comment on that guidance? The uh, guidance was put out for uh, a comment at the time that it was issued. Yeah, it, so that's, is that, I think that's kind of unusual for guidance as opposed to like rulemaking and, and uh, so I, I, I don't know why you'd need public comment on a guidance document that- We, we often do comment on guidance. Mm -hmm. um, what's the statutory authority that you would move in this direction? The, well, NEPA itself covers the impacts that would impact, uh, that would come from climate change. And that's, that's clear, and the courts have clearly said that. And so the idea of the CEQ helping agencies to think about how they meet that requirement is consistent with our uh, statutory uh, direction. Okay, so um, Mr. Mr. Miller was, was saying in his, uh, I saw your head nodding when I got into the complicated, I think we agree, the complicated big projects are the ones that we're really having the problems with uh, on, on both sides of the, where, whatever, wherever you are, ledger you're on, those are the ones that are causing, uh, causing the issues. Um, and, and you mentioned that things were, you know, you have single clear deadlines now in a coordination fashion. I mean, this is just not what you're hearing on the ground. I mean, we have a major project in our state and the federal agencies aren't talking to one another. Uh, it's, and it's just a, a, a serious delay uh, process on the ground and, uh, you know, to the point where it could cause a project to either A, leave, or B, be postponed for another year because of an environmental impacts, which this project is trying to ameliorate in a specific period of time that they can do it. And because the permit is so slow coming, they're not, they may not have enough time to, to move the muscles, basically, is what it is in, in the river. So I guess, what, what am I missing here? Why are we here if everything's going better and we're coordinating better? What, what are we going to do here to, to make these projects move faster? All I've heard is earlier engagement by the public. And, you know, I, I don't have a big objection to that, but is that the only suggestion I think we can both say that we are uh, we have improved the process, but we are far, far short of where we need to be. I think those can be both true. On the question associated with coordination, uh, there are uh, expectations and be making sure that we have a clear project plan in place with deliverables associated with the overall timeline that is transparent. Yeah, but they blow by the their like, timelines. So the, the agencies blow by their timelines. For each, for timelines, and I think this is a, uh, an important area and an area that we do need to continue to improve. One, uh, for each time that there is a delay in a project, we should all be crystal clear on the cause of delay. Agencies are required to have remediation plans in place, and one of the ways in which we try and hold them accountable is when there is a delay, they need to identify specific challenges. The other area that what we do, do need- I don't mean to interrupt you, but what does that really do? If they blow by, the do if they blow by their deadlines, and, the, and, and you're just asking, well, you have to give me a reason why you're blown by your deadline. Right. 
So the that doesn't sound very right. H his harsh. Historically, you had separate separate permitting processes that were operating independently. What we're trying to do is create them under an overall coordinated project plan with a lead agency responsible for yeah, delivering that. Yeah, one federal having, decision. Have, right, which is a requirement under which the bipartisan infrastructure law. Which has not been implemented law. over at the federal highways sufficiently to make those projects go, and that's been in the, in uh, well, I think President Trump put it in, and then we codified it in our, in our, uh, in the IIJA. Right. So we're still not getting satisfactory results from that. So the core construct of one federal decision for transportation projects is something that is being implemented that we need to, yes, continue to improve on overall process. One area that we need to tackle together is both investments in agency staffing and investment in agency systems. Yes, we need better coordination with clear timelines, but some of our processes are still paper-based. This is not just a problem in the permitting space, this is a problem more broadly, but it is exacerbated in the permitting space because you have multiple agencies, so you're sharing data in ways that are inconsistent, you're redoing analyses at times because you're, you don't have the systems in place. Those are areas that we also need to improve which would enable coordination to be more effective. I don't want to defend that the way it is being done right now is optimal. What I do want to say is we have made real progress. We are committed to it. I welcome working together with you and this committee to make sure that we're making more progress. Thank you. Okay. Um, before I turn to uh, Senator Cardin, I make a unanimous consent request a, re a reason why it's uh, important for the federal government to address uh, climate change in the permitting process and rulemaking is that climate is a real problem and an expensive one too, uh, I'd add. I'd ask, I want to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record uh, an accounting of billion dollar weather and climate events by the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It tells us that over the last five years, extreme weather and climate uh, disasters have cost the American people, get this, more than 595 billion, that's billion with a B, uh, $595 billion in economic damages. That's uh, on average, I think, about $120 billion uh, every year. And both of these figures are nearly double the 43-year inflation-adjusted annual average cost, without objection, so Lord. Senator Cardin, welcome. Thank you. Uh, let me thank all three of our witnesses. Uh, is one of these witnesses a constituent of yours? Uh, at least one. I know Mr. Miller lives in Maryland. Uh, right. I know the other two would like to live in Maryland if they don't, so. <laughs> Oh, two, two of the three live in Maryland. Why aren't you living in Maryland? <laughs> <laughs> Let me um, first thank you. And uh, thank you. I'm going to take a little bit different tact here because the permitting process is there for a good reason. And, and I am more concerned about the reasons for permitting being carried out than a rigid time schedule or a rigid decision-making process that could lead to the wrong decisions being made. So, uh, Mr. Miller, uh, let me start with um, the um, permitting action plan. I want to concentrate on the fifth part of that, which is adequately resourcing agencies and using the environmental review process to improve environmental and community outcomes. The Inflation Reduction Act, we've heard a lot about it, but one of the things it did is provide additional resources for permitting. So since you are the person responsible for those funds being allocated, uh, have we made progress in providing adequate resources to the agency so they can carry out these functions? We don't always get the same degree of support from our Republican colleagues who are complaining all the time on the time limits as to resourcing the agencies so that they can handle the responsibilities. Thank you, Senator. And yes, a critically important issue, as I was noting to Ranking Member Capito, uh, the $1.1 billion provided by the Inflation Reduction Act, $750 million to different agencies, $350 million to the Environmental Review Improvement Fund that FIPSI manages, are cr absolutely critical. Uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law also provided administrative resources which can be used for permitting. We're working with agencies, both on an agency-by-agency -agency basis and through the sector-specific working groups to identify areas of shortage. Staffing is one of them. So not only are we making sure that agencies are allocating their resources appropriately, we've looked and gone agency-by-agency -agency and what their staffing needs are. That's not a precise exercise because we don't have the complete demand projection associated with what set of projects is going to come in, but we know the kinds of areas that are shortages. It is things sometimes as simple as having enough project management expertise 
inside of an agency to own and drive some of these processes forward. In addition to staffing, our systems, this is a government-wide problem, our systems have been underinvested in for years and years, agency after agency. Even our ability to measure and monitor the performance of an individual permit down inside of a region is challenged. So that investment is critical. Thank you for your leadership, for Senator Carper's leadership on making sure that we have more resources. And I just really want to underscore this. Uh, we had a hearing yesterday, in this, or this week, in, yesterday, in the Senate Finance Committee on the Internal Revenue Service and adequately providing them the resources to carry out their responsibilities. And that was in the Inflation Reduction Act. These issues were put in the Inflation Reduction Act because we couldn't get the type of bipartisan support to pass them in the normal appropriation cycles. It is so important for the agencies to have the resources necessary to carry out our policies, and part of that is permitting. So it, it, it was included in the Inflation Reduction Act for a reason, because we couldn't get it through the other appropriation areas. And it is we hear complaints that you can't get the timely decisions, but if you don't have the resources, how can you deal with the challenges. So I just really wanted to underscore that point. The second point I want to raise is a little bit different from that. This committee's heard me on just about every hearing raising the Chesapeake Bay and the water qualities of the Chesapeake Bay and the permitting obviously affects some of the, well, the, the, water, the Clean Water Act issues. But I am concerned at times we don't respect local government's views and decisions as it relates to the permitting process at the federal level so what protections are put into this plan that you have come up with on permitting to make sure there's adequate local considerations by our local governments in the permitting process? Senator, I'm happy to take that one and would also welcome my colleague, Ms. Mallory. Uh, having good, strong, upfront community engagement establishing an expectation that agencies are conducting that, having a senior accountable official inside of an agency responsible for community engagement on key complex projects identifies issues early. It allows us to identify with project sponsors, project developers, ways to address those issues so that you don't create an incentive for conflict later, which oftentimes is the area where we, where we see concern. That is an expectation in the permitting action plan. Uh, it is an expectation on agencies that we're holding them accountable against. Ms. Mallory, as a Marylander, how are you going to make sure that Maryland's input is... is Absolutely. I think, it, I think your point is very critical. I think we recognize the importance of state and local governments in protecting their water resources. And in fact, one of the things, in addition to what we're doing in the permitting context where we have coordination with the local entities being critical, you know, one of the things this administration is, has, has underway is a, a um, proposal that the Environmental Protection Agency has done that specifically uh, is focused on Section 401 of the Clean Water Act and trying to ensure that the state and local governments have the uh, authority and the process that they need in order to um, uh, be able to weigh in on the water quality in their, in their areas. And so that, that is under um, process and I think uh, is addressing exactly the issue that you've addressed. Thank you. Mr. Miller? I just wanted to say thank you for your leadership on the Chesapeake Bay since I, with my five-year-old daughter, hope to be in the water of the Chesapeake Bay on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> It's the best way to spend uh, this weekend. Thank you. Just, just let me remind you that the state with the most five-star beaches in America is, is actually his neighboring state, Delaware. Well. <laughs> so we're, we're, got, we're pretty good buddies. So. Uh, all right. Uh, Dan, uh, we've been joined by Colonel, Marine Colonel. Uh, welcome aboard, uh, uh, Senator Sullivan. Your, your record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And by the way, speaking of uh, your... your uh, Outstanding military service right downstairs. The uh, Artemis crew that's just been selected to go to the moon yeah. is right down. And it's uh, three naval aviators, actually. <laughs> You'd be proud, just like you. Really impressive group right, right downstairs. Makes everybody proud. Um, uh, Ms. Mallory, I appreciated the phone call and discussion yesterday. You know, I think we're all very passionate about permitting. I certainly am. Uh, on, on getting projects uh, finalized on time. Uh, Alaska has been ground zero for many of the infamous delays, whether it's litigation or federal agencies or uh, lower 48 environmental groups where it just takes forever to get anything permitted and it really um, just hurts the average citizen. 
average American, average Alaskan. You and I talked about this issue yesterday, which I think is a really important one. There's been discussion, I think good discussion is starting to happen um, on permitting, but some leadership in the White House saying, well, we're going to do permitting reform, but only for these selected kind of projects. And, you know, it's renewables and things like that. I'm for all of the above. Wind turbines, solar, hydro, oil, gas. We need it all. Country needs it all. Bridges, roads, ports, you name it, we need it. Um, critical minerals. So uh, yesterday you said, hey, in your view, NEPA is agnostic. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, put its kind of uh, thumb on the scale. If we're going to do permitting reform under NEPA or other processes, do you agree that we, it should be for everything? All the kind of things that I just mentioned, we're not going to say, hey, we'll do wind turbines, but you guys who are producing natural gas, forget it. You, we're still going to make sure you're delayed by 15 years. What's your uh, thought on so, that? So uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. And, and as we, we talked about, I mean, the, the focus that we are placing on permitting is looking at permitting systems writ, writ large. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act is very focused on making sure that we have good procedures and good approaches on all of the work that we do. And in particular, the work that uh, CEQ has been doing is, is really trying to make sure that agencies have the data through the regulatory process that's necessary for all of their actions. Any other comments on that? Just the I appreciate that. It's important to state that, particularly given your important role in the government. Anyone else have a view on that? I only want your view if you agree with Ms. Mallory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the process improvements are agnostic to the types of projects. We need good decision making. We need good coordination. We need clear transparency. We need accountability associated with those decisions. Ms. Harada, you have the same view on that? I just want to hear from all you. It's a really important issue, actually. Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Senator. And I absolutely share my uh, colleague's sentiments with respect to the importance of ensuring that the process discipline and improvement in that is absolutely followed, regardless of whatever the technology is. Yeah. Let me ask another one that's kind of in a frustration of mine, certainly in Alaska. And this is even, I mean, this is your nightmare scenario on permitting. We've had several projects that have gone through their NEPA process several years. We had this road to the Ambler Mining District. Ms. Mallory, you and I talked about the Tongass roadless rule, um, a whole host of projects. Uh, there's one called the Donlin Mine. It's a big gold mine on Alaska Native owned land. And what happens in Alaska, and unfortunately the Biden administration has really been problematic in this regard, they actually, you've been going to a number of projects that have gone through NEPA gone through an EIS, taken five, six, seven, eight years, cost 10, 10 million bucks, and groups come and say, well, we didn't like that. Biden administration, reopen that, reverse that. And you're doing it, man. You are doing it in my state. And you want to talk about killing certainty. I mean, if you have a six-year NEPA process that costs 10 million bucks, example, the Ambler Mining Road, and the day the president holds his critical mineral summit, the Department of Interior says, by the way, Alaska, we're going to reverse that. You didn't consult enough. That's the big excuse you guys use for us. What does that do to investment? What does that do to certainty? I mean, can you commit to this committee that, hey, if you do a seven-year NEPA process, cost $10 million bucks by the professional staff of the federal agencies? Yeah, it was with the previous administration. I know you don't like those guys. But the vast majority of these were done by the professional federal employees. And then you come back and say, we're going to reopen that, and you will ask and start again. They're trying to do that right now on a mine called the Donlin Mine. It got its record of decision five years ago. Five years ago. I mean, we will turn into a banana republic if we start going to projects that were fully permitted five years ago and say, mm, we're going to reopen that. So what's your thought on that? I mean, permitting has to involve certainty. Reopening old EISs and records of decisions because some lower 48 environmental group is asking you to do it is not certainty at all. Can I get your guys' views on that? Because it's a huge problem in my state 
you're doing it a ton. I have a whole list that I could submit for the record, but it's crushing my state, the workers, certainty, investment. And it's just not right. Like I said, Venezuela does this, but America shouldn't do this. We're, we're a place, a country of the rule of law. Do you have a view on that? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, I appreciate the question. And I think as we discussed yesterday, as we're moving forward, one of our, our main goals is to make sure that we're giving the agencies clear enough guidance about what they need to do in their environmental review pro uh, processes so that they can proceed in a way that people can rely on it. I think you've described a number of different circumstances in which the judgment was that the, the environmental analysis was not adequate or the consultation was not adequate. Um, and so what we're how trying often, to do- I mean, How often, uh, respectfully, that's just a, you know, you're using that excuse in Alaska all the time, and we have these EISs that are completed, records of decision, millions of dollars spent, six, seven years, and you're coming in going, eh, not enough consultation, start again. I mean, that is the death sentence to any kind of, I want to get your guys' commitment to, to stop doing that, right? I mean, these are records of decisions that have been made by the professional federal government employees in your, your guys' positions, Department of Interior, and it's just killing the idea of certainty, particularly when it's focused on one state. We know it's my state that gets most of the action. Can I get your commitment, though, to just be really skeptical about doing that? You finish the EIS, the record of decision comes out. Again, right now they're trying to do it. There's a group trying to do it on the Donlin mine. Five years ago, we got all the records of decision. Some groups are trying to reopen it. We should just tell them no. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying, uh, Senator, is that I think what we have found, and I, I don't want to get into individual circumstances because that's I'm not familiar with it, but what we have found in a general way is that when there's a weakness in the uh, analysis, then we're going to find ourselves in court in ways that are, are going to lead us to go back anyway. And so I think the agencies are trying to balance that. Um, so on, you, on the particular circumstances you're describing, I don't know those details, but I do know that that's been an issue that's come up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, Mr. Miller, you want to have anything you want to add to that? No, Ms. Serrano. Okay. All right, we've been joined by Mark Kelly. Uh, uh, thank you. Senator Kelly, you're recognized. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for uh, being here today. Um, I've got a similar um, question that Senator Sullivan had. And let me, let me start with, um, you know, Ms. Mar Mallory on uh, the uh, permitting action plan released by the White House last year. So it identified several types of projects with, where the administration would assemble teams of experts to identify ways to facilitate siting, permitting, and environmental review projects. And the list of these projects included things like renewable energy and broadband, critical minerals, transportation projects. But it didn't include water infrastructure or water supply projects. And we've got this 20-year drought going on. So could you explain why the water infrastructure and water supply projects were left out? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, yes, I think what we were trying to do as we set up the, uh, um, the action plan was to highlight those areas where we knew there was ongoing and very active um, uh, actions, interagency actions of the most complex nature. And there were already some conversations occurring uh, in order to take advantage of the fact that so many agencies were working on them. So those lined up with the funding um, um, priorities that had been set by Congress and that they were areas where we knew that it would be helpful for us to uh, step in. We, we did not intend for that list to be a like exclusive list. I mean, the basic principles that are set out in the action plan and where we are kind of working with agencies around their, um, their NEPA and their permitting um, compliance in general go beyond uh, those sectors. Those sectors are just places that stood out as needing particular attention. So it's, it was a coincidence that there was just no water supply or water infrastructure projects included? I think the water pro projects, as I'm saying, is that, that we are, there is a 
there is a system in place, there is a familiarity with dealing with those, and so that just using the tools that we've identified for use for those specific sectors uh, is, you know, is we think is working. If there is a situation in which it looks like we need some the extra added benefit of a sector, I think um, that that could be added in the future. Okay, um, the four billion dollars that we appropriated, you know, through uh, to be used by reclamation is going to be in response to a lot of, you know, it's for drought yeah. and mitigation of the drought. So there will be a significant number of water supply and infrastructure projects. Can you talk a little bit about the actions, specific actions that your office has taken, um, and the administration has, um, in collaboration with reclamation to ensure that as we start this process, the NEPA process, that we don't face significant delays. Is there anything that you can specifically point to? Yeah, so this is, to me is another good example of where having the extra, the, the funding that is focused on staffing and resources from um, the IRA has been really important in allowing the agencies to position themselves around the uh, compliance that's necessary. You know, we have a um, separate, under the um, climate policy, um, task force, a separate drought-focused uh, uh, interagency group, and that interagency group uh, is, talks about the range of issues that come up with respect to those projects and how we can uh, to how we can get ahead of any uh, anticipated uh, uh, challenges, and that is working to assist us so that we're able to move forward on these projects uh, quickly. And Mr. Miller, anything more that you could share on actions at OMB and the administration's uh, taking to support the deployment of more water infrastructure projects? Uh, Senator, thank you, and thank you for uh, the question and your leadership on this, uh, on this issue. As uh, my colleague noted, staffing is an area that we've been particularly focused uh, at the Department of Interior. Uh, but also more broadly, one of the things we've been trying to support is identifying the specific capabilities and capacity that are needed for permitting these projects to make sure they're moving forward and working with the Office of Personnel Management to make sure that we have the HR strategic resources, the hiring authorities needed to onboard. The second area that we've been looking at is systems, systems capacity. We've been using some expertise from our U.S. Digital Service to dig in on that question, how data is captured, how data is shared, the underlying IT systems for both performance measurement as well as uh, capturing information necessary for both analysis and the permits. And finally, if I could just have a few more seconds, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Arata, uh, would a water supply project that's funded by reclamation using IRA funds be eligible for FAST 41 for that process? Thank you so much for your question, Senator. As a Southern California native, the drought issue is absolutely uh, central to um, our family's concerns. Um, to answer your question, sir, uh, fundamentally any project that is subject to NEPA and requires over a $200 million investment um, can and does qualify for Fast 41 coverage. Um, water infrastructure is indeed one of the covered sectors uh, that is um, authorized for us within the Fast 41 uh, statute. So the bottom line answer, sir, is yes. And, you know, we noticed that there were only four uh, reclamation projects listed on the permitting dashboard that your office maintains, and none of them were FAST 41 covered projects yet. So why do you think so few water supply projects get listed on the dashboard? Thanks for the question, Senator. One of the issues that we are trying to uh, address is that because the agency only recently became permanent in 2021, many project sponsors candidly kind of turned off their attention, if you will. You're not going to be around here in two more years. My project's probably not going to get permitted in that time frame. But since we've become more per since we've become permanent, again, thanks to this committee's leadership, uh, we have seen a renewed interest in the number and types of projects and a diversity of sectors. Uh, I attribute the lack of water infrastructure projects more to a lack of awareness about the FIPSI and the Permitting Council and our authorities and our capabilities, and that is something that our team is very actively working on and would very much appreciate your support in getting the word out, sir. Well, thank you. We'd like to see more of these water supply projects qualify for a FAST 41 permitting process. Thank you. Senator Kelly, thank you. Thanks very much for, for joining us. We've been joined for the second time by uh, Senator uh, Ricketts. We are now have 14 recovering governors who serve in the U.S. Senate. I'm proud to say that he and I are two of them. 
and I'm going to yield to him right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our witnesses for uh, joining us here today to talk about this very important topic of permitting reform. The permitting process takes too long and costs taxpayers too much money, and with all the ambitious projects that we have for our country, not the least of which is creating more power generation, transmission generation, roads and bridges, permitting is uh, going to be very important to get right so that we can get these projects done. One of the things that this committee has heard me talk about is the permitting reform we did in Nebraska. We leveraged a process improvement methodology called Lean Six Sigma to streamline the processes. So for example, for our air uh, construction permits, we were able to take the time it takes uh, down because we limited the number of processes from 110 down to 22, and that cut the process down from 190 days to 65 days. Uh, another one was our green sheets we do in our Department of Transportation. We cut that from 87 steps down to 60, and that process uh, went down from 16 days to three days. So in a variety of ways, we've been able to streamline the process just by getting rid of duplicative steps. Um, Ms. Mallory, at the Department of or the Council for Environmental Quality, are you familiar with um, Lean Six Sigma or other process improvement method methodologies? Uh, uh, thank you so much, Senator, for that question. I'm not specifically familiar with uh, Lean Six Sigma. I am familiar with lean processes. That's something that the federal government has done uh, in the past. And, and I would say just, uh, you know, in terms of the framing that you put on it, you know, our goal, um, as we've been talking today, is to make sure that we have, you know, smart decisions that are, you know, meeting our environmental uh, re requirements and including public engagement. And so, if, if looking at lean is a tool that shows ways in which we can do that, I think we would be open to learning more about what the system uh, offers and how it could fit in. Okay, great. So I, I presume from the, your response that you're, you're not aware of anybody who's using it right now uh, within those areas. I, I'm not specifically not what you described. I know that lean has been done in the federal government for other... Um, but not necessarily on the permitting process. Yes, okay, correct. Great. I'm not aware of that. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, and then, Mr. Miller, are you familiar with lean or lean processes? I, yes, sir. I Would am you say familiar. just generally, like, looking at how you can streamline the processes? Again, you're not changing any sort of requirements, just as a, it would be a good thing to yes. implement? A absolutely. I'm not a Lean Six Sigma black belt, but I am familiar with it. We should, uh, that is a technical term. Uh, <laughs> the uh, process reengineering is something that's absolutely necessary in this space. Uh, I think what you're speaking to, cutting out unnecessary steps, unnecessary back and forth. One of the com uh, complicating factors in this instance is uh, steps required between agencies. Uh, so we both have to do processes that look internally within an agency and then more broadly, as well as the engagement from that process with state and local governments and the project sponsor to just cut out waste from the system. Funny you should mention black belts, Mr. Miller, because we actually trained up a number of our teammates uh, starting, everybody got white belt training, which is the introductory level, but we also trained up uh, over 5,000 yellow belts, we did green belts, executive green belts, and then our black belts actually were responsible for working on processes that involve multiple agencies within the state of Nebraska, so there's an opportunity there. And then uh, Ms. Harada, thank you very much for your work on the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Lean Six Sigma and those, or typical types of process improvements? Thank you for your question, Senator. As a former management consultant, I'm rather familiar with Lean Six, <laughs> um, and I think the work that you did in Nebraska is fantastic. Um, to, to build on uh, both uh, my colleagues' question, uh, answers to your previous question, sir, um, we are indeed undertaking some of those types of efforts with much more focused on a particular project, if you will, um, working through both not just from the process step side of things, but also from the policy and ensuring that we are ins uh, ensuring that there's good data sharing both between the federal agencies as well as with the state governments that we're working with as well. Well, the, I mean, I'm going to put you on the spot then a little bit here. So as you've reviewed some of this stuff, where do you think the biggest obstacles are in the processes, or what process in particular has the most opportunity for improvement? Thanks, Senator, for that great question. Uh, I attribute the fundamental issues to three things. First is around, as, as my colleague Jason Miller was just articulating, data sharing. The, enhancing the technology and the types of data that we could be, should be sharing, not just amongst the federal agencies, but also with our state colleagues 
and with the project developers would be absolutely vital to ensuring that we're cutting down the time frame and making that a lot more efficient. Secondly, agreeing on what the information elements are and should be. We find in our experience at the Permitting Council that frequently there is a lost in translation element that frequently federal agency uh, biologist nerds don't speak broadband deployment. No, and just so, so you know, I am a biology major, okay, just so you know. Careful there. I, I'm an aerospace <laughs> engineering major, sir, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, and so therefore, that type of nerd speak, they don't speak the same kind of right. English. And so we do serve that type of translating role, if you will. And certainly, last but not least, having that clarity around what the master chart, Gantt chart, should look like, what is the critical path for ensuring that we can get the permitting process through, having that kind of transparency and coordinated project plan, and as, as I think also super critical to ensuring that those kinds of processes go much more smoothly. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you two have found common cause. They speak <laughs> the same language. That's great. That's great. We've been joined by Senator Merkley. Uh, welcome, and by Senator Markey. Senator Markley, you're recognized. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, Ms. Mallory, uh, if we were to burn all of the identified reserves of, of fossil gas, coal, and oil, would we break the 1.5 degrees goal for humanity? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, I feel like I can't quite answer that. I know burning all of the reserved fossil uh, gas would, would be problematic. Um, I can't answer the question that you've in the way you've framed it. Okay. So uh, most of the estimates are that if we burn half of the identified reserves collectively, we break 1.5 degrees. Is that a problem? Uh, again, thank you. I mean, as, as you know, the administration is very focused on meeting a net zero goal um, by uh, 2050, and the president's agenda is very focused on decarbonize as quickly as we can. So those are the steps that, we're, that we are taking to sort of move in that direction, recognizing that we're in a transition, which does not enable us to stop everything. So we already have a massive amount of fossils that have already been permitted for extraction currently in the United States, massive amount. So given that burning half of the reserves in the world that are currently identified, why is the administration approving new fossil gas and fossil oil projects? Uh, again, thank you for the question. I think the, what the administration is, is doing is recognizing that we are moving in a certain direction, but we're in a transition phase. We're not in a position where we can completely stop uh, uh, approving uh, all uh, projects today. We're, we're, we're getting to that point, and by doing it, by reducing the amount and the way in which uh, some of the projects have been approved. Let me just say, factually, scientifically, you are wrong that we have already issued extraction permits for a vast amount of additional fossils, and therefore no new permits are required for new oil and gas and coal. And so I find it interesting to read that the proposal being promoted on the House side is to do permitting reform that allows new fossil gas permits while delaying discussion of what we really need, which is transmission capacity in our electrical network. Shouldn't it be the reverse? Shouldn't we be focusing on permitting for the transmission of electric power first, rather than focusing on expediting or increasing the number of fossil fuel permits? Uh, thank you again, Senator, for that question. I mean, I think this administration is very focused on transmission and is using the tools that we have available to us now uh, to address transmission in a, uh, in a way that is uh, expedited. The uh, memorandum of understanding that was signed uh, last week by a number of the agencies is, is designed to help us uh, use our tools and the authority that the Department of Energy has uh, under uh, the Federal Power Act to, to move forward on transmission as quickly as possible. But that is a place where there is a need for congressional action. So I can have confidence 
that absolutely the administration will reject any path forward that involves more permitting for fossil fuel projects while delaying any changes or any debate on improving transmission? Uh, Senator, I think what I'm saying is that we understand the importance of transmission moving forward and trying to have the tools necessary for that. So you cannot assure me that the administration will not agree to more fossil fuel permitting while leaving transmission to a later date? Uh, no, Senator, I can't. Well, that's, that's horrific because we're in the situation, my state's burning up from, from climate change. We already have issued permits for a vast amount of additional fossil fuel extraction. We need to pivot to renewables quickly and should be expediting the things that make that possible, not issuing new fossils while blocking the things that will make renewable possible, which is electric transmission. Don't you agree with that? I think, uh, Senator, as I said, I think the administration is trying to look holistically at where we are at this moment and trying to move as quickly as possible towards the decarbonization and using um, our, our, our means to do that. There are circumstances in which I think the, the administration has felt that permitting was necessary and that is how they acted. All right, I'll just close by noting I was just recently uh, in Southeast Asia and one of the countries I was in was Indonesia, which has a very large coal industry. I've also spent time in India, which has a very large coal industry. I've had conversations. I led the dialogue between American legislators and Indian legislators at the Paris talks. And the uh, Indian legislators said, hey, why should we take on our coal industry while the U.S., which has one of the largest carbon footprints per person in the world, where we have one of the smaller ones, is still permitting new oil and gas. Why should we take on our coal industry? I was just in Indonesia. They have a big coal industry. They have put out a theoretical vision for 2050, which is great, but it's like a castle in the sky. And you ask them, you, you hold the conversations, and they're like, yeah, but when we're not doing anything concrete. You know, we have a powerful coal industry. And look, the United States is still issuing new permits for fossil fuels. So my point I'm just ending on uh, is that, one, we don't need to issue any new permits for fossils because we've already issued a huge amount for fossils to be extracted in the decades to come. And second of all, doing so is undermining any moral authority the U.S. has to help lead the world in tackling climate change. And this is the biggest issue facing humanity, and it is a huge mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, uh, we've been joined by uh, uh, Senator Kramer, and uh, it was good to see you, and uh, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here. Um, I, I'm glad I got here for the last couple of minutes of that because I am perplexed by the idea that somehow we have plenty of fossil fuel permits issued well into the future. We are waiting on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prepared permit applications on federal land in North Dakota. The cleanest oil, by the way, in the world, it, it, and the produce the cleanest um, in North Dakota, even after a judge has ordered the, the uh, administration to stop violating their law and, and doing the required by law uh, quarterly uh, auctions uh, on the federal lands. It's, it's, it's incredible. I, and, and the idea that somehow we're gonna just electrify everything um, with some new transmission lines. By the way, I, was a, I, I cited lots of transmission lines when I was on the North Dakota Public Service Commission. I never had a hard time permitting a transmission line in North Dakota, never did. Now, we always had trouble when we got to the, to the Red River beyond that, so we had to trick the system in ways to, to we'd create more, trans, we'd take more transmission of our product into the big towns in North Dakota and use existing transmission lines to move our other, our other electricity, that, that have legacy lines that have gone into Minnesota for decades. Whether it was wind or coal or natural gas, um, we have all the above. Um, and so I, I empathize a little bit with the siting of transmission, but I don't think that, that what we're talking about, if, if we do what HR1 is suggesting, it's not just about fossil, it's, it's about all energy. It's, about, it's, it's, it's fuel neutral. But when you start talking about paying for these projects that are localized, that's where things get complicated. And I, I believe, uh, and, I, and I, one thing is I love about Senator Merkley is he likes to debate. Um, we don't do enough of it, do we, Jeff? We don't do enough uh, debating around here, enough, enough, enough talking. So anyway, 
all of that, and I haven't even begun. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I thank you all for being here. I have a, a, a question. I may not ever get to any of them that, I, that were prepared, <coughs> but one thing is, first of all, I'm disappointed that there aren't any agencies here that actually issue permits, but I'm hoping, Mr. Chairman, we'll have one of those too, right? A, a hearing that actually... If you want us to, we, we just might do that. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, not that you're unimportant to the process, but, um, but we, we need to talk to some people that actually permit some things. Do you, do you guys think, and I'll start with you, Ms. Mallory, since you, you oversee, CEQ oversees NEPA, and, and obviously um, there are projects, uh, and we had a lot of discussion, bipartisan discussion, about um, you know, the, the process and the timelines, as we've been talking about. Do you think timelines can be an enforceable Thing. In, in other words, whether it's the two-year EIS, one-year EA, um, how would we enforce that? And, can, and do you worry that it could be gamed by the favored fuel? Which, whichever fuel that might be, it could be on either side. Do, do you worry about that? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. I mean, I think that what we've tried to focus on in our uh, permitting action plan is a recognition that we need to have um, agencies uh, focus on what is possible on a particular project so that you have ambitious timelines uh -huh. and that you set those timelines in ways that allow the agencies to take into account what the requirements on that project are or what the specifics of that area are, but that um, you, you use that as a driving force behind their behavior. And then the accountability measures actually come through the oversight the, the interaction that we have with the leadership of the, the agencies, making sure that they're staying on track and uh, that we have the ability to respond when they need additional resources or when we need to have agencies share or um, in the interagency process to work more effectively. So that's what we are using or believe is an appropriate way to uh, address the oversight. Let me just, one of the things when, I, when we were citing pipelines in North Dakota, and I cited a lot, Keystone, original Keystone Pipeline, 600, Landowners, not one inch of it was taken. Not one inch of that land was taken. It was it, it, kind of amazing. I don't know that we could do it today. Um, but even gathering lines on federal lands and whatnot, we found a way to streamline the process through the, in, you know, the interagency process with, with actually adding environmental protections. In other words, there was even more review because there was a synergy of all the agencies working at the same time rather than, you know, in chronological order, they were working collaboratively. And, and this is, that's a win-win. Whatever side of the issue you're on, that seems like a win-win. We need to get to that. I don't know that another council <laughs> in the process actually helps it a lot. Um, I was going to ask you about major questions doctrine at the courts and, sh and the potential Chevron doctrine and the imp imp impact that might ha have. Well, go ahead if you want. Well, I'm just, if, does anybody have any thought on that? Um, you know, the, the, the court's recent decision in, in um, West Virginia versus EPA, for example, um, I know it's not permitting specifically, but it, it is related policy in, in terms of agencies taking, taking authorities that weren't granted them. Do you watch that more carefully now that the court has said, no, listen, you don't, it, the absence of a prohibition is not a license to create power for yourselves. Is that a, is, is that? Yeah, I mean, well, thank you for the question, uh, Senator. I mean, obviously, when the Supreme Court rules on an environmental policy, we take that very seriously and organize ourselves with that, with that in mind. Good answer. Thank you. I'm sorry we didn't have more time. I got, I got fired up. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> That's not a good bad thing. thing. Um, Senator Markey, good morning. How are you doing? I'm fired up. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. <laughs> this is a great hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In that case, we could be here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so right now, our project development systems in the country, it's like a car moving slowly down a bumpy road. And some of the Republican proposals for permitting are the equivalent of trying to fix the car by just throwing out the brakes and the steering column. Uh, you'd go faster, but you wouldn't end up anywhere good. So, Chair Mallory, would changes to the National Environmental Policy Act, such as requiring approvals within a strict timeline or setting firm page limits, how many pages you can actually use in trying to describe a decision which being made, would they help to speed up a project permitting or would they complicate the process? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. I mean, I think what we have done in our action plan is to focus on the importance of having, um, uh, a, you know, accountable goals and targets that we're working for. We think that that is a helpful 
um, mechanism for the, for the system and that it enables both the uh, agencies to work around it but also gives some transparency to the public. So we think it's important to have goals. Those goals from our perspective need to be mindful of what is required of uh, a particular project development so that you're actually focused on what are the needs in that situation and that may make adjustments along, along the way. So we think that you could have projects that go faster than in your targets, but you can also have projects that recognize that some adjustment may be necessary. Ms. Serrata, in your experience uh, with projects going through the permitting council, uh, uh, would shortened NEPA timelines help or hurt interagency coordination? Thank you so much for the question, Senator. As you may be familiar, uh, the Permitting Council works with the most complicated uh, projects of the 100,000 or so projects that are permitted every year. We truly are working on the 0.1% or so of the, most, of the largest and most complicated infrastructure projects. Um, with respect to your question on page limits um, and whatnot, I think that um, whatever Whatever types of suggestions and targets we want to implement, make sure that we're not unnecessarily or very rigidly constraining the agencies from arriving at the, at the best solutions, whether they be from a technical perspective, of course, obviously environmental protections, but ensuring that there's really good um, and sustainable community outcomes, excellent tribal engagement, so that we're all on the same page and lockstep with respect to ensuring that we're delivering an infrastructure project that is actually viable. Thank you. Yeah, to really fix the slow progress of developing projects that can help our communities thrive, we don't need to attack NEPA. We need better road signs, better drivers, a better road. And that means including environmental justice communities early in the process, improving staffing and chains of command in the administration and in state and local agencies, and implementing policies that will fix our transmission system. Um, Ms. Harada, if NEPA timelines or page lanes for reviews are not the issue here, what do you observe as major drivers for delays in the system today? Yes, thank you so much for the question, Senator. I think it's truly thoughtful because the true drivers of major permitting delays largely are uh, threefold. First, there is insufficient engagement up front with the communities that are potentially impacted, the tribal nations that need to be involved in the process. Nobody likes a surprise. Nobody likes a solution to be imposed upon them. And it's incredibly useful and a fantastic investment upfront to engage those communities in the overall project design. The second is around ensuring data quality and collective understanding between the federal, the federal agencies, state agencies involved in the process, as well as the project sponsors <coughs> with respect to what data needs are specifically required in order to be able to answer the pertinent questions. And certainly last but not least, in that regard, ensuring that there is sufficient agency capacity available to be able to actually do the work that is needed to ensure that we're following the respective authorities. Thank you. And, and if we don't have public engagement and consultation with tribal and environmental justice groups, and if environmental assessments and impact statements are rushed or poorly done, projects can be held up in the courts and wind up with even more opposition from local stakeholders. It's the paradox. So, Chair Mallory, could you please elaborate on how a robust NEPA process and engagement with environmental justice communities can actually help prevent delays in project development? Uh, thank you, Senator. And that, you know, you're speaking to what we believe is a really important part of the process and ensuring that we can keep the timelines. We have, uh, NEPA has always encouraged early engagement with communities, early and often is a phrase that is commonly used. And in the permitting action plan, as well as our engagement with, um, with the agencies across the board, we're emphasizing that because we do think that it allows for avoiding some of the problems that might be uh, unknown or not lear learned about until late. And the result of that is extending the, the, the process because of litigation or because of just the, the concern of communities not um, being willing to buy in because of a lack of trust. So uh, we definitely encourage that. Thank you. And uh, obviously, um, our conversation about developing a clean energy future shouldn't focus myopically on NEPA and permitting of new projects. Issues like transmission planning, cost allocation, 
interconnection lines are also delaying much needed investment in clean energy transmission. And while I'll be reintroducing my CHARGE Act to direct the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to take action to address these and other issues, FERC could act to fix these issues right now without any need for new legislation with their inherent authority that they already have. Mr. Miller, do you agree that FERC has the ability to improve the way clean energy projects get planned and connected to the grid already with the existing authority? Senator, thank you for the question. Thank you for your attention to this topic and making sure that we're all focused on the need for more transmission, including some of the small projects that uh, are interconnects, the critical for offshore wind. Uh, I know there is uh, some debate on the use of FERC authorities. It is clearly a priority of this administration. We outlined it in terms of potential legislation. Uh, I understand that FERC is also looking at ways to utilize its authorities, including <coughs> through regulation, and there's uh, uh, a, a pending chair or a pending seat that would require to be filled to move forward on certain regulations. But solving this problem, whether through existing authorities or new legislation, we, we have to do or we will not meet our climate goals. Yeah, and, and so that's the bottom line. We've got a, a two to two FERC. We've got a two to two Federal Communications Commission. Okay, it's, it's actually, you know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, he used to say that when he didn't want to help an issue or hurt an issue, you just engage in benign neglect. You just don't do anything. But this is different. This is designed neglect. <laughs> it's not giving the agencies the resources they need. It's not having a fifth commissioner to break the ties. It's not making it possible you know, for us to be able to move forward when all the inherent authority is there. It's designed neglect of a system. And then turning and saying, well, the answer is more permitting. We need actually more fossil fuel projects that are put online while there's delays that are built into the system because of design neglect for the transmission system to be modernized so that we can have the clean energy be put on it to remove the need for additional fossil fuels. So thank you all so much for your um, testimony. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence and in letting me go on a little bit longer. Before the uh, senator from uh, Massachusetts leaves, I want to thank you for the CHARGE Act. Uh, the, uh, uh, our staff and I spent a, lot, a fair amount of time with your staff. You and I have discussed it. And I think it uh, needs to be included in whatever proposal comes out of this committee going, going forward. So thank you very much for that. And, and, I, uh, and I thank you and your staff as well. Yeah. Thank you. For, they've uh, been you bet. Great. They've been great. You bet. Uh, my, um, well, let me see. I got, we got a couple more questions here, and I'm going to lead into this question. It'll be a question for each of you to answer. Um, I go to work uh, almost every day on the train, and uh, the guy named Biden used to do that. We used to actually ride together sometimes. And uh, another guy that used to ride the train a lot was Albert Einstein. And uh, believe it or not, and he would, uh, I think he was taught at, I think maybe Dartmouth, if I'm not mistaken. And that, but he would take the train up to New York or he'd take the train down to Washington quite a bit. And one, uh, one day was, he got on the train and uh, sat down. He started looking for his train ticket or his train ticket and he couldn't find it. And he's like, he's, uh, before the conductor comes by, he's, I've been in this predicament before, but he's looking for his train ticket, he's looking at his coat, his pants, he's looking at his brief, briefcase, can't find it. And the conductor comes along, young guy, and he says, Dr. Einstein, we know you. We know who you are. Uh, you're good. It's, it's okay. We know who you are. And uh, the conductor starts to walk out of the, the car, goes at the other end of the car. He's about to leave, go enter the next car. He looks back over his shoulder. Dr. Einstein's down on his hands and knees, and he's still looking for his train ticket. The conductor rushes back. And he says, Dr. Einstein, we know who you are. You don't have to do this. We know who you are. And Dr. Einstein looks up at him and says, I know who I am too. I just don't know where I'm going. Isn't that a great story? Um, I, uh, I said earlier in, the, in the, uh, the hearing that I thought there may be three objectives that, uh, that we should pursue in terms of like, where are we going? And I've modified that during the course of this uh, hearing. So I think maybe uh, the uh, uh, what we need maybe think about four objectives in terms of where we're going. And I just want to mention those to you and ask each of you just to uh, think out loud about which, which ones make sense, which ones don't. 
or if they need to be modified, but four objectives. Uh, for the first, any serious proposal uh, must reduce greenhouse gas emissions while upholding our nation's bedrock environmental statutes. I'll say that again. Any serious proposal must reduce greenhouse gas emissions and uphold our nation's bedrock environmental statutes. That would be one. Uh, a second would be um, address transmission barriers that make it harder, address transmission barriers that make it harder for renewables to connect to the grid, address those barriers that make it harder for renewables to connect to the grid. To the grid. A third uh, would be that uh, those proposals must support early and meaningful community engagement. Those proposals must support early and meaningful community engagement and the fourth, in terms of where we're going, would be the legislation that we eventually adopt, send to the president, must provide businesses with certainty and predictability, must provide businesses with certainty and predictability that they need to make long-term decisions. Again, provide certainty and predictability to businesses that, uh, that need to make uh, informed long-term decisions. And I just I want you all, this is probably not an all-inclusive list, but uh, for our, my staff and I worked on this a little bit, and I've tried to put it in terms and words that folks can understand. And uh, so let, let me just ask each of you to think out loud. Uh, Ms. Uh, Christine, why don't you just go first? And um, if you say those are the four dumbest ideas I've ever heard, I won't be offended, but I don't think you're going to say that. Oh, well, thank you for the opportunity, Senator. And I am in um, as violent agreement as much as possible with the four objectives. Did that you, you say outlined. violent agreement? Oh, I, I, we don't uh, hear that. Yes, I think we don't hear that term very often. Of table, um, if I may Shall offer. Shall we need to have more violent agreement here in the Senate? No way. Um, if Go I ahead. may uh, offer up one clarifier, if if, if it's okay with you, uh, with respect to the third bullet around early meaningful community engagement, a hundred percent. If I may also add a clarifier with respect to tribal nation uh, and government to government consultation, please. Uh, frequently in our um, experience, specifically calling out tribal nation engagement is key, ensuring that federal agencies are indeed prompted to go out and actually do it. Okay. Uh, and so that'd be super critical, please. All right, thank you. And thank you for introducing a new term, <laughs> violent agreement. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Mr. Miller, please. Uh, Thank you, Senator. Uh, I think this is a good list. What I would just add to it, and one of the common themes you heard from the three of us and many of the questions, is ensuring that we have systems in place inside of our agency, including the technology systems, data systems, and people needed to actually carry out this work is absolutely critical and something that we have underinvested in for far too long. Good. Do you think we're continuing to underinvest, or do you think we've uh, sort of atoned for our sins with respect to investing? I think the investments in the Inflation Reduction Act in particular with the $1.1 billion, both to agencies and FIPSI, is a critical step forward. We have to execute on those investments, and that's what we're working on right now. That focus, ensuring that we continue to have those resources, we get appropriate appropriations on an ongoing basis so that agencies have certainties that they can make multi-year technology investments mm -hmm. is often a place that we stumble. Okay, good, thank you. Chair Mallory, do you like being called Chair Mallory? I actually like to be called Brenda, but nobody listens. Uh, um, uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, list as well, um, Senator. And I think I agree with both of the additions that um, that my um, my colleagues have made. Um, I think, uh, in particular, just uh, in in talking about upholding the bedrock statutes, um, I just want to underscore that the emphasis on uh, having. Uh, sort of smart decisions that are based in science. Like I think that's a critical element that we wanna uh, not lose. And that, holding on to that may also uh, uh, affect what is uh, a reasonable uh, choice when you start to talk about timelines and other um, 
uh, ways to frame the, um, the way the process runs. So like just reminding ourselves that that's our anchor. The point of a permitting system is uh, to protect the public and we just wanna make sure that whatever we do doesn't lose sight of that. So thank right. you very so much. Keep, uh, be, be guided by science, uh, continue to be gu guided by science. Some of the, my colleagues and I are uh, big music fans and uh, uh, going back in, uh, in time, there used to be a guy, named One Hit Wonder, uh, his name was Thomas Dolby, I believe, Thomas Dolby. And he had a, a one big hit, and the song was something like, uh, She Blinded Me With Science. She Blinded Me With Science, you may remember that one. Uh, I always say, uh, we don't want to be blinded with science, but we ought to be guided by science, and hopefully that, uh, that'll continue to underwrite everything that we do. With apologies to Thomas Dolby, so. <laughs> All right, um, well, I've been joined by, uh, I, uh, Terrific colleague, and uh, from a, a, a large state, one of the two largest states in, in America. <laughs> Rhode Island and Delaware. There you go, joined at the hip. And we're actually, we're joined at the hip on a lot of issues as well, including the ones we're talking about here today. And I'm delighted to yield uh, time to him right now. Gentlemen, welcome. Well, thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, I believe very much that this committee has a very important role to play in the permitting reform conversation that is going to take place in the Senate. And I appreciate your leadership in making sure that this committee's role is real and vindicated. Um, and I look forward to working with you, and I thank you for including the transmission siting proposal in the bill. I hope to be able to get you an offshore wind permitting reform proposal shortly. We're uh, going through the final strokes on that. Um, and that really is going to be my topic with this terrific panel of witnesses. Thank you all for being here. Rhode Island is very close to offshore wind. As you know, we solved the siting problem first and got the first steel in the water and the first electrons on the grid. And I was very close to that process at the state and federal level as it went out. And um, what I have seen is the offshore wind industry come in with enormous uh, enthusiasm and confidence that has been replaced by anxiety and caution. Um, I think that we are at risk of losing offshore wind projects. Eversource, which is one of the partners in a big offshore uh, project off of Rhode Island, announced to its investors that it was getting out of offshore wind because it no longer saw it as a viable business proposition. And there seems to be considerable anxiety about the permitting and regulatory uncertainties and delays that is driving that perception of risk. So um, I think we're close to having a real problem in that area if that isn't addressed quickly. I know that the so-called Sherpa left the White House who was guiding this. I don't know if there's a new Sherpa to help move through. Um, I'm terrified by interagency process. I know it's a phrase that everybody loves and it does indeed get everybody in the room, but it is um, very often, I think, death by interagency process that ensues and um, that the pace of interagency process is the pace of the slowest and most at least competent and most recalcitrant agency in the interagency process. And at the end of the day, nobody's accountable for the interagency process. Everybody just points at each other for a failure. So I'm very, very anxious that interagency process as a solution to what I see as a very dramatic degradation of confidence and enthusiasm in the offshore wind industry in our ability to get these projects onto a reasonable timeline for investment um, is a real, it's, it's more problem than solution. And I worry that we're getting to the place where unless some real hands-on leadership takes place, we're gonna see companies backing away and we're gonna see the president's pledge to get to 30 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, simply no longer feasible. Um, so I would really urge, if there's stuff you need in our offshore wind permitting reform, get it to me now. We need to move this along. Um, and I'll flag one other piece of legislation I think is important, which is our RISE bill. If you want to do offshore wind in the Gulf of Mexico, 
than to set up a situation in which when the local neighboring states, their legislatures and their governor look at further investment in oil and gas and see a 37% share of revenues coming to their state, and they look at an offshore wind alternative to that and see from that investment zero coming to their state, that's a pretty easy equation for a speaker who has to put a budget together or a governor who has to work with the legislature to say, oops, we're getting the signal from the federal government that we want more oil and gas exploration. We're rewarding states for pursuing oil and gas exploration. And when it comes to the offshore wind, I think the Delawarean and Rhode Island term would be bupkis. So um, I... I think the administration uh, may need a reset on the offshore wind process, and I uh, am more than happy to participate in trying to accommodate that, um, but I really, really, really don't want to see this turn into a cascade of failures um, as com more companies pull away from projects. Sheldon? Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we got our work cut out for us, but I, uh, I think we can do this. I, I like to quote uh, Henry Ford, who used to say, among other things, he used to say, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And uh, we, uh, there's... Well, let's make this a can. Yeah, we we really make... do need those 30 gigawatts. We really do need these jobs. It really is important, and we really need to get out of our own way. There you go. Um, I... Um, I have a couple of specific questions for you, but I'm going to give, ask a, a general question for each of you. Something you uh, would like to have been asked, you were not asked, that you would just like to pose a question and then answer it. Uh, I'd like for you to do that. What, it, what it maybe would you like to have been asked, were not asked, you think is appropriate, and uh, give us a good answer for that? I don't do this for just every panel. You know, it's just special panel. I, I was hoping Senator Markey would follow up after he was talking through the dynamics on transmission. Uh, and the challenges, uh, including the prioritization around making sure that we are reforming the permitting process, the specific, uh, the specific item when we're talking about uh, whether it is a good or bad thing to have equivalence across different technologies, the specific thing that we're talking about is having federal backstop authority. That's a thing that currently exists for natural gas pipelines but we don't have it in the same way for transmission lines. I don't think there is objection to the existing backstop authority associated with natural gas pipelines from this committee, at least not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. And so that should be a proposal consistent with an approach with another technology where it has support for us to be able to move forward. Uh, that's good. Let me just ask both the uh, majority staff and the minority staff to, to write that one down. In the Navy, when we, we used to do training for airplanes and ships and everything, or we'd have somebody who's a lecturer who's training our enlisted officers, our enlisted folks who are in officers, they'd reach a, a point where it was just like a really important point and it was gonna show up on a test later on, and we would say that the, uh, whoever was lecturing would stomp their foot, and that might be a foot stomper, so I just hope we'll, we'll not, not forget that one. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let, uh, let me ask a, uh, make a, you know, uh, this is my favorite part of the hearing. Uh, I get to ask a, you know, oh no, Sheldon's still here. Uh, so I, I get to ask, a, make a unanimous consent request sometimes when nobody's here except the folks in the audience and me. And then I make, uh, I ask unanimous consent that something happened, there's nobody who objects, so it just happens, so. But uh, today, uh, Senator Whitehouse can object if he wishes, I hope he won't, but my unanimous consent would be this. There are a number of permitting bills that have been released, and I too intend to release a, a bill uh, soon. We call it sort of a, a, a draft uh, proposal, but uh, soon, very soon, in fact. Uh, it's important uh, that we get uh, this right. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to ask uh, unanimous consent to request that members of the public, members of the public, uh, share feedback on these permitting bills um, with this uh, com com committee. And there are several of them, and the one that we'll be uh, unveiling uh, very soon will welcome comments from, from uh, the public on what they like, what they don't like, and maybe get some good ideas. Um, all right. Senator, can I... Yes, please. 
Can I go back to your your last question? Because I did want to weigh in on. You don't object to my unanimous consent. I don't object to your unanimous consent. That is wonderful. Uh, I've one, never had a witness do that. that would be uh, the one thing I wanted to uh, uh, raise that I that I was not asked, but I think is important. Uh, oh, is, good, good. Is that um, one of the things that we at CEQ are working on is the kind of completion of the rulemaking process. You know that we started under the president. Uh, asked us to look at um, the, what, whether we needed to make changes to the previous administration's rules. And we said, yes, we thought we did, and we were going to do it in two phases. We did phase one. We're working on phase two and hoping to get phase two out very soon. But it also builds on many of the themes um, that we've heard here today. And so um, when that proposal comes out, in a, hopefully in a matter of weeks, then people can kind of look to that and see how it fits into our efforts for greater efficiency, our efforts to make sure that environmental justice communities are integrated into our process, and our, our efforts to ensure that climate change is addressed appropriately. Good. Thank you for, uh, for adding that. Um, Ms. Rod, I, I don't think we gave you an, answer, an opportunity to ask a question of yourself and then answer it. Yes, sir. Thank you again for the opportunity. I think there's a couple of things that would certainly be absolutely helpful in enhancing the overall permitting efficiency um, overall. Uh, firstly, and I know we've discussed this during the hearing, is around ensuring that there are also state and local government uh, alignment and capabilities as well. They serve just as an important role in getting these infrastructure projects permitted. Um, as a recovering governor, I approve this message. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, secondly, is also investing in the fundamental capabilities for enabling permitting. So I know that Jason has touched on uh, in, in, uh, investing in the data management processes, ensuring that we've got the permitting workforce that we need and the experts appropriately in place to be able to do that. And certainly, last but not least, providing some additional clarity to those agencies to be able to leverage some of the um, categorical exclusions and other methods that provide for uh, efficiency will be super helpful. Good. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, I have a, a follow-up question, uh, Mr. Miller, for you that um, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask. We'll see if you can take a shot at it. <clears throat> we hear a lot about how the courts are slowing down projects. We've heard a little bit of that here in this, uh, this hearing today. And I've some, seen some uh, legislative uh, proposals that remove uh, judicial review of uh, federal per uh, permits altogether. We, uh, what are the, the real world implications of eliminating judicial review for environmental uh, reviews and permits? Uh, in your view, is there a better way to facilitate uh, judicial, timely judicial reviews? Chairman, th thank you for that question, for raising the topic, which has been touched on lightly here today, uh, but I know is a part of proposals. It is part of various statutes, including the FAST 41 statute in terms of time limits associated with judicial review. Uh, having a mechanism, stepping back, having a mechanism to resolve conflicts when there is fundamental disagreement is important. It is important that we able, are able to identify those issues on the front end. One of the reasons that community engagement is so critical so that we're not creating an incentive for conflict later in the process. But we have to have a mechanism to resolve conflict. That mechanism should not drag out because we need to ultimately resolve conflict or we just have brewing conflict. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, question, uh, if I can. I, I know you invited us to call you Brenda. I, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Mallory for, for now. But the president uh, recently released a, an executive order on um, environmental justice, as you know. Uh, which uh, directs uh, agencies to consider the cumulative uh, effects of, of uh, pollution and other uh, burdens like climate change in their actions. Um, would, uh, would you speak uh, to us for a minute or two about why it's important to consider cumulative impacts as part of environmental reviews? Uh, yes, Senator, thank you so much for that question. Um, um, yes, and I will just say that for all of the work that the, this administration is doing on environmental justice, one of the key um, uh, you know, factors that we are focused on is ensuring that all communities get the benefit of clean air, clean water, and a safe community. That is the kind of the premise on which we are operating. And the executive order really builds on what the National Environmental Policy Act uh, has required for um, all but the time that the previous administration was in effect, which is direct, indirect, and cumulative effects. That's what the analysis requires. Um, and so what we're saying for environmental justice communities in particular is that 
if you are building whatever you know the the project may be, if you hone in only on that project and not think about the context in which it's being set, then you're not really fully considering what the impacts are that the people who live there are going to be ex are experiencing. So that's what cumulative impacts about. It says you have to not only look at the item that is the that's causing for the action, but then what context is that being set in from an environmental uh, as well as a human health perspective. And so that's that's what we're trying to ensure that communities that, were, that have experienced underinvestment and that have suffered from legacy pollution are, actually have those issues addressed. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I've got to give uh, a, a short closing, uh, closing statement. I'll, I'll start it off by just saying thanks uh, so much. Thanks so much for what you do with your lives. And uh, thank you for your willingness to, to work uh, with, uh, with us. Uh, the, uh, I'm not sure who said this. I used to think it was my dad, but it's, I've heard it a lot in my life. But it says, the hardest things to do are sometimes the things most worth doing. And I think what we're trying to do here is, is not easy. In fact, it's pretty hard. And uh, we're, this, something, this committee is pretty good at doing hard things. And we're proud of, uh, of, of that. Uh, our ability to help write the major portions of the bipartisan infrastructure bill that we talked about earlier. Uh, the work we've done uh, last Congress and again in, in this Congress on on uh, uh, recycling the legislation, we're, we're working now, uh, I think both Senator Capito and her staff and my staff on permanent chemicals, PFAS, and, and PFOA and all those. Uh, we're, none of these are easy, but they sure are important. And we find one of the best ways to make progress is to, to, to do it uh, to, together. I like to say bipartisan solutions are lasting solutions. And Senator Capito and I and our colleagues are pretty good at that with the help of our, our staffs. The, um, anything uh, that uh, you all would like to say to each of you, uh, just briefly, maybe a minute back, but uh, in terms of helping us um, get to those bipartisan solution, the bipartisan lab, bringing us together rather than, a lot of times people focus on you know, things we're gonna fight about, disagree about, but it's something that might be helpful as we go forward to, uh, to get us to uh, uh, closure and uh, something that we can embrace the legislation, legislation can uh, embrace and as can the environmental community or states, tribes. Uh, any, just one thing maybe you can say, well, as, as you get ready to take your pens out and write this uh, legislation, don't forget this. Uh, Christine. Go ahead. I was asking Ms. Rada. Uh, I think we've done, thank you, Senator, for the, for the question. And again. you can repeat, I mean, you, repetition's not bad. Uh, I, I think, um, I think that we have done a reasonably thorough job of covering the major elements um, of any such proposed legislation and, and reforms, um, and we very much look forward to rolling up our sleeves and working with you. Please don't hesitate to call us. We're absolutely happy to jump in on this. Great, thanks so much, yes. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, two things, just reiterating what you were saying, making sure that we're moving forward on bipartisan reforms is critical too. One small thing that we haven't touched on extensively here, but part of what we've been trying to do in all of these things is take an enterprise approach to permitting rather than doing the same thing 27 different times on 27 different projects. One of the ways in which we can do that is expansion of the use of programmatic reviews. To the extent we can do that administratively, we are seeking opportunities to do so to the extent additional legislation is needed to do it and directing agencies, that's an area that I think is fruitful. Good, thank you. Ms. Mallory. Uh, yeah, thank you. I feel like I've said everything that's most important to say. The only thing I would add is just that, uh, just using as an anchor as you're thinking through the ways in which we can improve the permitting system, um, what the impact is gonna be on communities and people. I think that will help us to lead to a result that we will all uh, be proud of. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I heard a great quote from Teddy Roosevelt. I was surprised to find that it was Teddy Roosevelt who said these words, but people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Now that's not the thing you expect Teddy Roosevelt, a rough rider, but also a great environmentalist. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, which is, sort of speaks to the community involvement piece of, of, all, of, of all of this. Um, uh, in, um, let's see, short closing statement. Uh, in uh, closing, uh, I want to again thank uh, each of you for taking time to prepare for today, uh, to uh, pre present, your, present your testimony and to 
to also respond to our, our questions and give us some, I think, some good uh, advice as, as we go forward We're looking for the bipartisan solution I think that we all want. Uh, we appreciate your thoughtful discussion of opportunities to improve the federal environmental review and permitting process in a way that supports our transition to a clean energy economy, as well as your identification of safeguards that must uh, not be uh, compromised. As I said in uh, my, my opening, uh, opening statement, it's essential that we address the climate crisis by rapidly transitioning to a clean energy economy. And that means we must build clean energy projects and infrastructure far more swiftly than we've been doing uh, to date. We must also accomplish this while ensuring that historically disadvantaged and underserved communities have a real voice in these decisions. Your testimony today provides us with valuable guidance as we move forward in this legislative process. Before we adjourn a little bit of um, housekeeping, some senators will be allowed to submit questions for the record through the close of a business um, on Wednesday, May 31st of this year. We will compile those questions. We'll send them to each of you. We'd ask that you reply to them by uh, Wednesday, June uh, 14th, 2023. And um, I'll close. I, I mentioned earlier, um, Senator Capito and I both natives of West Virginia. And so was Joe Manchin. And uh, a bunch of our neighbors, when I was a little, a little boy, my sister and I were little kids, um, a bunch of our neighbors worked in coal mines. In fact, my dad coming out of Shady Springs High School at the age of, I think, 15 or 16, worked in a coal mine for a while, decided he didn't want to do that. And uh, ended up uh, going off to fight in a war. Uh, and uh, come home. Uh, the, um, uh, there are a lot of folks in West Virginia and frankly in a bunch of other states that uh, they are fearful of what we're doing. And they're fearful because they're afraid they're not gonna have jobs and, uh, or they're not gonna have good jobs. And uh, I always like to put myself in other people's shoes, golden rule, treat other people the way I wanna be treated and to make sure that the people who might be displaced because of or, or we're away from fossil fuels to, to um, uh, clean energy, uh, we got it. We can't uh, ignore the concerns of those people. We have to uh, take them seriously and, and treat them the way we want to be uh, want to be treated. I know Senator Capito feels that very deeply, as do I think I think all of us do. And that uh, takes. Uh, uh, it's just it's, we need to continue to remind folks that we're not going to we're, we're not going to just walk away and say, well, to hell with you. We're just going to you know turn the page and. We'll just generate all of our electricity from wind and solar and, and, and so forth. We've got to make sure that the people who are disadvantaged and who may, who may be suffering a bit because of that transition, that we're going to help them too. We're going to help them too. And uh, th I think we have a moral obligation to do that. And with that, I think it's a wrap. And with that, we, we thank you again very, very much. Somebody has stolen my gavel, <laughs> but I got it back. Thank you so much. We're adjourned. <laughs>